All right, it's been a couple of weeks since I did one of these, and you already know what I'm going to say, work. <laughs> yeah, work has kept me uh, pretty backed up. I know the last time I did one of these, I was going on about the more about alcoholism bit, uh, and I didn't feel the need to go through that entire chapter line by line. I think we pretty much got a good synopsis of that, but of course, uh, the, the one chapter that I've always said that I hate more than all the others is We Agnostics. And I used to, there was a meeting I used to go to where they would read that uh, every Sunday morning. And I mean, literally every time there was a Sunday afternoon meeting it, it, and it was always packed to the gills. It was one of those meetings where it was fashionable to be there and all of that. The, uh, the chairperson who was inevitably there, he would always read out of that chapter. He said that was the chapter everyone had to get, you know, and, uh, and the rest of the the rest of the thing was just awful. I mean, it was just you know. I remember I was court ordered during the time that I actually had to go to AA, not volunteer, not voluntarily, but when I was actually mandated and forced to. That was one of the meetings that was approved, and uh, and I finally just had to find another meeting to get a sheet signed at because it was just too horrible. I mean, you'd have, I'd have to hear people talking about how they you know their higher power found them a parking space, or I, I even heard one guy say. Uh, uh, that he told that he looked up into the sky and said he was going to drink if he had to keep walking in the rain and immediately the rain stopped and the sun came out. I mean, I wished I was making that up, but yeah, I mean, actually the creator of the universe just turned the rain off for him because he was threatening to buy some booze, I guess, if it, if it didn't get turned, if the rain didn't stop, but I decided I was going to go ahead and start attacking that chapter. I mean, it was a chapter that I just really always despised having to sit through, so I figured, why not? And uh, uh, to start with, I guess I'll just dive right in. It says, in the preceding chapters, you've learned something uh, of alcoholism. Actually, no. Actually, the, the chapters right leading up to this, and all it is is we have a half-assed doctor's opinion making kind of... Uh, making assertions about things without any scientific proof or without any statistics to back it all up. Uh, and you've got a, a couple of other chapters. Well, you got Bill's boring story, which most of that, by the way, was, was pretty much fabricated. I can do more topics on that in another video when I get an opportunity. Uh, and then you just get a bunch of uh, bullshit from more about alcoholism, which is what I was attacking in the last videos. So... It goes on and says, we hope you made the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. Well, that's something AA can't even do in of itself. Uh, AA is always talking about, you know, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you get sober through the AA program, then, you know, it's because you were an alcoholic and the, and the AA program and AA God and all of that saved you. But if you, uh, you know, if you stop drinking on your own, leave AA, then you never were an alcoholic to begin with. Or, you know... If you uh, leave AA and don't die drunk within a few days, you're either a dry drunk who's going to get drunk and die pretty soon, or you're never were an alcoholic, or, you know, so they're always constantly shifting the definitions of everything, so I don't really know exactly how you make a clear distinction here. Is There is one, one part in the book right before this where, where he's talking about uh, you have certain people who can drink hard and fast, and they can quit when they want to, and some of them might even drink themselves to death. But the alcoholic is different. See, I never, I, it, it's almost funny how he's got that all worked out. He's got it worked out that there are people who can drink themselves to death. There are people who will lose their jobs. In fact, I could page through this online thing and find it if I want to, but I, 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 I pretty much sum it up with that. And he says there are people who can lose everything, bottom out, end up on the streets, be homeless, uh, commit suicide, uh, die from liver failure, and yet they're not truly alcoholic because under the right conditions they can stop. Uh, but an alcoholic cannot under the right conditions, even though AA says that if you've had enough, you can stop anytime you want to. You ever wonder why they would always say in meetings to people, you don't ever have to drink again if you don't want to? Well, I, you just told me I was powerless over alcohol. You just told me that there's no way I can stop, that there's no human power that can relieve me of this. Now you're going to tell me I don't ever have to do it again if I don't want to. So, no, they haven't actually made a distinction between anything by the time you get to this chapter. All they've done is a lot of blabbering. Uh, but now he's going to say, if, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely or... If when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, 
you're probably alcoholic. And you know, he throws the probably in, so that way if, if you defy uh, his little statistics or you defy his assertions or you just don't live up to his notions of reality, then he can say you, you weren't really an alcoholic to begin with. That's, that's the one clause the cult throws in on purpose. I don't believe that's an accident. Then it says, if that's the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience can conquer. Well, I have never seen any scientific data or any proof whatsoever that says a spiritual experience will conquer uh, a so-called disease that's never even been scientifically proven. You know, there was a big argument not too long ago about nature and nurture, uh, in genetics and and all of that and no i mean the, the jury i think is pretty much still out on both fronts i mean you know there's been cases i, I guess you could you could take my own life as a as a as an example here i mean did i end up drinking heavily and gravitate toward drinking because my family are drinkers or did i gravitate towards it and end up doing it because i grew up seeing it and i grew up in an environment around it and <clears throat> you know that is why I, 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 you know, I learn by what I see. I think little children oftentimes emulate what they see at home. I think oftentimes when you see little children behaving a certain way, there, there may or may not be, I can't make a 100% sweeping uh, statement implying to everybody, but I think there might be some indicator of something at home or something uh, in the child's life where it's learning that that's, you know, an acceptable form of behavior, whatever it's doing, whether it's good or bad. Uh, that's just... That's just an unprofessional opinion. How about that? That's just something I'm guessing. Because I, I've seen so many of my own father's mannerisms uh, and his traits in myself as I get older. I see his... Uh, there was a couple of uh, things he would do when he was worried. He would pace around outside and he would smoke. And I and I do that. Now, did I do that because I inherited that? Or did I do that because I kind of learned it as a little kid watching it? You know, I don't know for certain. But as far as a... Uh, an illness that only a spiritual experience can conquer, I would have to say that uh, I haven't seen anybody in AA uh, convince me of any soundness of any spiritual experience. I've seen a lot of old timers that flat out lie to your face. I've seen a lot of sexual predators who sit in the rooms and claim to have had a spiritual experience that do everything quite the opposite. I've seen uh, every type of vile human behavior in the room. So, I mean, did they have a spiritual experience that just said you don't have to drink alcohol anymore, but you could be a fucking asshole to anybody you want? Uh, and, you know, you need to define what a spiritual experience means exactly, because if you ask, uh, if you ask, say, a, a Buddhist or you ask a Christian or you ask uh, someone who practices shamanism or if you ask someone of a different uh, type of uh, religious faith or a, or a spiritual track, what a, what a spiritual experience means, they'd all give you very different answers. Uh, so, you know, you never even define in the AA book what a spiritual experience is. All you do is go on and on about how you're supposed to surrender uh, to this bullshit program and how you're supposed to grovel and how you're supposed to confess and do inventories uh, for the rest of your life. You don't say anything at all about a actual spiritual experience. I know you got that appendix in the back there where you, you know, Bill goes on about, you know, and, and you'll hear him talk about it in meetings sometimes, and it, it's so fucking boring, you know, where they talk about uh, Bill had a white light experience. They don't tell you he was high on hallucinogens and in a hospital when he did that. They, and then they'll talk about common variety and all of that. Uh, but you still never do adequately sum it up in any kind of way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, nor do you give me any clear, defined definition that, that sums that up for me. I mean, what if you had some kind of weird spiritual experience and you suddenly believed uh, that there were, you know, aliens in the universe that were beaming messages to you that only you could hear, and they were telling you to go out and commit violent crimes or something like that? I mean, would that be considered a, vi a valid spiritual experience? Because, I mean, after all, you might not be drinking, uh, when you're hearing that kind of thing. I mean, so without a proper definition, you're not giving me anything to go on there. You're not even doing anything but making a grand statement. You know, I could say something like, you know, if you're bored playing computer games, uh, you may have reached a skill level that only a really awesome game can conquer, you know, your boredom with. I mean, it's, it, it's nothing. It's meaningless. So... Uh, and here's, here's where we get to the rub of the thing. To one who, who feels he's an atheist or an agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. But to continue as he, me, as he is means disaster. 
especially if he's an alcoholic and a hopeless variety. Okay, he's a hopeless variety. So there's different levels of alcoholism now. <laughs> to be doomed to an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. All right, several problems here. <laughs> One, you didn't define spiritual, okay, and now you're saying to those who feels he may be, a, he, you know, he may or may not be atheist or agnostic, such an experience may be impossible, but to live the way he is is, you know, is doom and gloom or whatever. So, what you're really saying here is that you you've got to accept uh, Bill W's cult religion or or Bill's understanding uh, or, or or made up definitions of spiritual experiences uh, or or die is what he's saying and then they're they're trying to claim to you that you can anybody can be a member of AA they say that you know the only desire for for membership the only the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking but here he's more or less telling you that if you're an atheist or an agnostic unless you can manufacture some kind of weird spiritual experience that he cannot define you're going to die if you are a hopeless alcoholic which he didn't define that either so <coughs> It's really kind of difficult to, to glean any useful information out of this because you don't have anything here to go on, really. But it isn't so difficult. About half of our original fellowship were exactly of that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. I doubt very seriously uh, that anybody was just hoping they weren't a true alcoholic in order to avoid that issue. I think when I got to... When I got to AA, I mean, I had, you know, I guess if you'd have pinned me against a wall and said, what do you believe? I would have identified at the time as Catholic, even though I wasn't praying, even though I wasn't going to mass, even though I didn't, I hadn't actually done anything in regards to that. But it was, you know, since I had been in that household my entire life, that's just what I would have called myself. But that's what I would have thought of myself at the time. It wasn't that I was... Uh, hoping that I wasn't an alcoholic, what was happening is if somebody came at me with this, with this, with this shit, I would have said, "Well, wait a minute. You know, I came here to try to quit drinking. I didn't come here to get to get a fucking religion rammed down my throat. Are you trying to tell me I got to, you know, have some kind of religious idea here?" But of course, the AA people would always say the same thing. They would say, "You know, well, we're spiritual, but not religious." Yeah. Okay. So let's go on with this. Uh. After a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Wait a minute. We must find a spiritual basis of life or else. So in other words, they're lying uh, when they say the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. They're lying when they say there's many ways to get sober without AA. Uh, because they're more or less saying if you're a real alcoholic, if you are a true alcoholic, um, that you have to live on a spiritual basis or you're going to die. So they didn't really give me an option here to, to, to say there's a way around this. They're saying that you have to find a, a spiritual basis of life or else. So the people who try to go around saying you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be a, a believer in DNAA, they're, they're kind of uh, lying to you right here. Now they're saying, well, he didn't say, you know, be religious. He said, uh, find a spiritual way of life. Well, you know, you're not really actually giving me any kind of alternative when you push this in my face. If you're trying to claim you're spiritual but not religious, uh, let me give you an example. I mean, you know, some guy comes to me and he says, I'm having really bad freaking migraine headaches. I don't know what to do about him. And I say, well, if you, you know, if you're a true sufferer of migraine headaches, you're going to have to find out that you're going to have to, to live on a spiritual basis or else. I mean, doesn't sound very open-minded, doesn't sound very tolerant, doesn't sound like someone who's saying there's many ways to get sober. It sounds like you're giving somebody a, an ultimatum. You're saying get spiritual or die, but we're not a religion. That's, that's pretty much a conflicting message. Okay, let's just go a little bit further. Perhaps it's going to be that way with you. Uh, what he's really saying is, is most normal, ordinary people who are suffering from an addiction problem, uh, they want help putting down the fucking drinking and the, and, the, and the drugs, okay? They don't want you to ram some mumbo-jumbo pseudo-bullshit down your throat that doesn't even have a clear definition of what it is. I mean, this sounds almost like, uh, you know, this almost sounds like a parody of a cult. It doesn't even sound like a real cult. I mean, it's so vague and meaningless here. Our experience shows us that you need not be disconcerted. Uh, no, of course not, because we're going to sell you the cult religion to live in for the rest of your life. 
then he goes on. This used to be the part that really used to burn me up my ass, too. He says, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried, probably because it's not a philosophical or moral problem. Uh, we could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. Uh, well, philo philosophy has never been uh, made to comfort you. I mean, have you ever read some of the philosophers that are out there? I mean, their works are not designed for comfort. Their works are actual speculation as to the meaning of life and what life is. I mean, and some of it's not always pretty. Some of it's actually quite uh, soul-crushing if you look at some of the works. I mean, there was a guy named Ernest Becker uh, I remember his book was called The Denial of Death. I read that when I was going through a really, really dark nihilistic phase in my life, which more or less says we just live our lives uh, because we're afraid of, of death, that, that everything we do and everything we, we behave towards is just a means to be delusional about death. I mean, it's a really bleak, horrible type of thing <laughs> to dwell on. I remember, uh, if, if you've ever seen, it's, it's a hard-to-find film. It's called The Sunset Limited uh, with Cormac McCarthy, it was the writer of it, but it was it's with Samuel L. Jackson and Tommy Lee Jones. There's a scene where you have the optimist and the pessimist, but Tommy Lee Jones says, you know, who would want to live in this world if not for the fact they're afraid of the next one? I mean, philosophy doesn't comfort. Philosophy is meant to provoke you. It's meant to make you think. So he doesn't even understand philosophy here. In fact, we could will these things with all our might. Well, you know, most people that I know of uh, who are drinking and drugging are probably not sitting around saying, gee, I wish I could be moral. I mean, I never drank beer uh, or, and drank vodka and saying, I wish I could be philosophically comforted. Let me go read, uh, let me go read the works of, you know, of Nietzsche. Let me go look at Schopenhauer in his pessimistic essays on life and be philosophically comforted because I'm drinking all this beer, you know, or drinking all this vodka or shooting, you know, for other people out there, you know, if you're smoking crack or putting heroin in your veins, I don't think you're, you're actually thinking about philosophy and morals. I think you're thinking about the fact that I'm fucking addicted to this shit and I can't stop. I mean, that's, that's just, that's silly. I mean, <laughs> Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Uh, no, what you're doing here is you're taking people who have gone through a rough period in their life because they can't control their addictions. They can't do anything about their addictions. They're trapped in a cycle that they cannot get out of. I mean, I know that feeling all too well. I've been the guy at 3 o'clock in the morning who's drinking a half gallon of vodka at 3 o'clock in the morning and thinking, God, I just wished I could fucking... Get a grip on this fucking addiction problem that I got. It doesn't mean my will uh, utterly just failed completely like he's trying to push this off it. It means that you're so physically addicted to your substance that you like doing so much that you don't know how you're going to break out of it because you're physically dependent on it. I mean, ask anybody who's ever had to drink in order to be normal. Ask anybody out there who's ever had to drink in order to get a healthy appetite again. Ask anybody out there who's had to... Uh, who's had to shoot up heroin in order to function in the morning, uh, if it's about willpower, if it's about the fact that you're so physically dependent upon your addiction that you can't stop, that there's no way you can stop. Uh, not to mention the anxiety overloads, not to mention the panic attack feeling that you would get. You know, I used to wake up uh, vomiting in the morning uh, with, with, with just crippling anxiety and crippling pain, and I knew if I could get about a pint or two of vodka in me, I wouldn't have that pain anymore. So it has nothing to do with the will. It has to do with the fact that you've drank yourself into a state of dependency. But the answer for that is not having some weird spiritual experience. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. They put that in big italics for us. Uh... Yeah, obviously, but where and how are we to find this power? Well, that is exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. That means we've written a book which we believe to be spiritual and moral, and it means, of course, we're going to talk about God. Wait a minute. Without having to go over every puking line of that, you're more or less saying that you've written something that's spiritual, that's moral, and that you're going to talk about God but you're not a religion. <laughs> You've written something spiritual, moral, 
and you say in this in this blatant assertion type way, you say, and that means we're going to talk about God. But you're not. But you're not a religion. You're not. You're not selling me religion here in this chapter at all. You're not writing a chapter here so far that I'm analyzing that's more or less saying you're a fucking drunk or you're a drug addict or you're a hopeless dope fiend or whatever it is you want to identify yourself as. You're like this because you're morally deficient, uh, because your will is a fail, and because. Uh, you are not going to be able to make it without a spiritual experience. And that is what this book is all about, to help you find God. But you're not a religion. You're not giving people a religious solution. You're not, you're not actually, uh, uh, you're, you're not scientifically based at all. As a matter of fact, we're actually 20 minutes into it. And I don't think anybody actually sits and watches past, you know, 15 and or so. So I'm going to stop at that one. But I guess the next time I pick up, we're just going to keep uh we're just going to keep attacking this chapter some more and more and more because, I mean, it, it is so plain right here to see that what he's doing is saying he's selling religion. That's exactly what this book is all about, to, to sell you God, even though he kind of dodges it by saying, oh, but it's it's whatever power you want it to be, just as, you know, but we're going to talk about God in here, but you can call it something else, just as long as you acknowledge that it's the one that took away the drink problem. Right, but it's not a religion at all. It's not a religion at all. It's almost like a old magician's trick, you know, nothing up my hand, nothing up my sleeve, right? I see you guys next week, hopefully. Hopefully I won't get tied up in overtime again. I worked, uh, I worked 12 days this week, last week and this week without a day off. Today's the first day I've had off in almost two weeks. So see you guys uh, next time.